would please turn to Romans chapter number 12. Continue our uh, lesson we started last week on the process of transformation. Uh, read along with me or our quote, if you would please, the first two verses of Romans chapter 12. I beseech ye, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the reading of your word. Thank you, Lord, for the Apostle Paul, Lord, who wrote the book of Romans, Lord, to uh, help to prepare us, Heavenly Father, Lord, for living in this world. I pray, God, that you would help us, Lord, to be transforming Christians. Lord, it, it, it never stops. Lord, until the time that we get to heaven to spend time with you. And I pray, God, that you just bless. Bless the teaching of your word tonight. If we ask your precious name, amen. Thank you very much for standing and reading. Now, last week we talked about how change is inevitable, but change is also constant. We're always changing. Things are, are changing uh, uh, in our life, in our body, in our circumstances and things. And uh, just like um, our regular change, uh, we as Christians need to be transforming uh, into the image of Christ's Son. Now, why is uh, this transformation so important to God? It's important because through this process of change, we come to know him in a deeper and greater way. And that's what we, what we need to do. We, we want to get to know him. It's kind of like when you met your, uh, for those of you who are married in here, when you met your spouse, okay? I don't think any of you just walked up to some stranger and said, hey, will you marry me? And they said, yes. And you went to the justice of the peace and there it was all, all said and done. Okay, you, you, you saw each other, then you wanted to get to know each other, and you found out things about each other and uh, things and uh, in that, and the more you found out, the better you liked them, or for sometimes the more you find out about them, then you think, well, maybe I don't want to talk to this person uh, in that, but the more we find out about uh, the Lord, the sweeter the fellowship is. And as we transform into his likeness and we get closer to him, we enjoy a sweeter fellowship with him. Uh, a lot of times we, we, we may look at other people and say, wow, I wish I had that walk like that person did. And if you talk to that person, it's because they're walking closer to the Lord. They know them better. And uh, if I needed to talk to somebody that maybe perhaps that you knew, I might go through you to find out uh, some information uh, about them. But when it comes to God, aren't you glad that we have total access straight to him? We don't have to go talk to someone else to talk to God for us. But we have a 24-7 hotline directly to him. And, and the more we get to know him and uh, the closer with the fellowship we have, and then we also find what incredible joy we have in life. Now, uh, you can be joyful even in, in, in difficult circumstances as you are in tra transform, uh, transforming. Now, we talk, started last week by talking about how transformation uh, is a process. It doesn't immediately happen. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, you're equipped with everything that you need okay, to be a, a Christian, but... It's a process of change. Things have to, to change. And we want to, we talked last week how uh, we want to encourage you to not quit. Because in real life scenarios, when you become, uh, a lot of times we become a Christian and the difficulties and stuff come, we think, you know what, I just don't want to do this. But then uh, as, we, as we don't quit and as we, we learn and, and we uh, gain knowledge of, of what we're doing and, uh, and knowledge of Christ, then it gets, it gets better. But then we don't need to be satisfied. We need to set a mark, get to that mark, and then say, okay, I've made it here, and I want to set another mark and go, and just never be uh, just satisfied. There's a danger in the Christian life when we just come to satisfaction and we just don't want to grow uh, anymore. We need to be growing consistently. And then as we are growing in the circumstances and stuff that, that come into our lives, we need to make sure that we don't become overwhelmed uh, with, um, with things. 
And uh, just remember that the Bible says that I can do all things through Christ, which what? Strengtheneth me. That, that, that helps me along the way. So that's where we stopped last week. So uh, we'll pick up this week uh, in this, that not only is transformation a process, but transformation is personal. It's your decision. You have to decide whether you want to grow or not. You have to decide how you're going to grow in that. Now, how many of you uh, back in the day took driver's education? Hey, I remember when, in, when I was in, in high school, they offered it. I took it in the summer. And uh, we, had a, uh, we had a young uh, Colorado Highway patrolman that came in and, and taught the class. And, and uh, he was a super nice guy. And I remember watching all the different movies and, and different things and even driving. How many of you got to drive simulators? Driving a simulator sometimes, just very few. I remember going in there. I remember I had simulators before class, and oftentimes I would look back, and he had been on patrol that night before, and he was asleep in the back while we're all going through the simulator stuff. But the first part of driver's ed has to do with education, doesn't it? You, you, you read a, a book. They, they teach you some things. They teach you what the, what the rules and regulations are for driving, different things about driving. Then the second part of driver's ed is the actual getting behind the wheel and driving the car. And I remember uh, the first time that I uh, had an opportunity to do that with the driver's ed teacher. My, my dad had already been, uh, once I got my permit, had been taking me out and, and teaching me to drive. And the best thing he did for me was to teach me how to drive a stick. He wouldn't let us learn on my mom's car with an automatic. We had to learn to drive his Datsun 510 station wagon with a stick, and, uh, which was kind of cool. I remember the first time I peeled out. And uh, by accident, and uh, and I looked over at my dad. He goes, "That'll happen from time to time, but don't let it become a habit." And uh, and uh, so, but uh, uh, but I remember driving w- with the teacher, and he said, "We're driving from here." We were living in Colorado Springs at the time. He says, "We're driving down to Pueblo." That's a good, you know, forty-five minute drive. And he said, "And the other guy will drive back." He says, "I got to go pick up my wife's." Uh, uh, sewing machine, so you guys are just stuck with going with me on this errand. And uh, but it was nice. I'm driving down, and and uh, then the other kid driving back. But I was able to put into practice, and then he would ask us questions along the way, things like that. Uh, in that, now you have to, in order to get a a license legally, you have to be able to pass both parts of that test. You have to pass the book part, but then you also have to dry, pass the driving part. Uh, of the test. And I remember on August 29th of uh, uh, the year that I got my license, which I can't remember what year that was. And uh, I remember going and I passed the book test and that was good. Then I got out there and drove the car and uh, thought I did perfect. And I remember when I got back, he goes, well, he said, you did three things wrong. I was like, uh-oh. I said, what was that? He said, well, you failed to signal when the lanes went from, 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 from two to one. I said, do you have to do that? He said, yep. And he said, and then you did a Hollywood stop. I said, what's that? He said, you didn't quite stop at the stop sign. You, you, you stopped, but not long enough to go through that. And I was like, okay. What was the other one? He goes, I don't remember, but you passed. And uh, in that, so, and I was like, hey, that's all, all I cared about. And, uh, and I had my license. And, I, and, and back then, I'd already bought my car. And you could drive like right away. And uh, I found out that, you know, the freedom that I thought I had in driving just meant that I became the taxi for my mom. No longer did she have to take my sister's places. I got to, but that's okay. I enjoyed driving. And, uh, but here in the book of, of Romans, uh, the first cha- 11 chapters of the book of Romans is like that first phase of driver's ed. There's a lot of book knowledge. Uh, Paul is teaching us how, how, uh, how we are saved and how we get sanctified and how we are freed from the law uh, by God's grace. Then starting here in chapter 12, it begins phase two, the practical experience, putting into practice what we have learned in the classroom. This is how, where each of us must learn uh, to allow the Lord to transform us. Romans chapter 12, verse one again says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, he's talking about those who are saved by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This verse instructs us, for uh, it gives us instructions for personalizing this spiritual change in our hearts. We give God the permission to have us, 
to, to have us. Now, transformation is a work that the Lord does in us personally. Now, the church family or a family member or a teacher even a spiritual mentor cannot make that decision for you. There are a lot of people that influence our lives. Uh, as we uh, have kids graduate out of our youth group every year, especially those that have grown up in the church, you can look back and, uh, and see where uh, different people in the church had influence on them. From, from the nursery uh, to uh, two and three-year-olds and then all the way up uh, and through the, the different people that have influenced uh, uh, the lives of the young people. But uh, we can influence their lives, but we cannot make them live for Christ. They have to, to want to do that themselves. Now, that it, is one, excuse me, it is one that you must allow God, uh, uh, it's a decision that you do need to make to allow God to accomplish a work in you. Now, you may be wondering uh, this, but how exactly do, uh, do I allow the Lord to transform me? Is it his job or is it mine? Now, if God is the one who does the work in me, what do I need to do uh, in order to him, allow him to do that? The answer goes back to uh, chapter 12, verse 1. You present your body a living sacrifice. In other words, you say, God, everything that I have, everything that I am is yours. I want you to transform me. I want you to, to help me uh, uh, in that. And uh, and that's what a living sacrifice is. It's just giving completely over to God. Now, uh, you make this transformation a personal matter by surrendering your life to the Lord and allowing him to work in any area of your life and to change any aspect or to take away uh, any distraction and remove the sin. Now, presenting yourself to him, you're allowing him to conform you to the image of his son. Uh, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, it says, For whom he did foreknow and did be predestinate, and he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be uh, firstborn among many brethren. When uh, Abdiel got off the bus early in the morning on Monday, or actually Tuesday, I think uh, um, his sister told me he got in. He, he called them at 3 o'clock in the morning, which would have been midnight in California. He began a transformation process. He was a civilian, and now they are transforming him into being a Marine. First couple of weeks of his life in the Corps are going to be tiring and miserable because they are breaking them down. When we get saved, God starts to break us down. He starts to break down that old sin nature that we have. Our sin nature always wants preeminence in our life. But we cannot be conformed to the image of Christ with a sin nature. So God starts chiseling things off. And sometimes it comes off a lot faster uh, than in others. Um, and so we need to allow God to do his work and be patient with that. We should not waver or hesitate with circumstances. Now think back when you received Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. You received the gift of salvation. Ask yourself this question. How has my life changed since that day? Now for some of you, that was a long time ago. For me, I got saved back in August of 1975. That was a very long time ago. But for some of you, you go back even a little bit farther. How has God been changing you since then? Are you the same exact person as you were on that day? I hope not. You shouldn't be. You should be being conformed to the image of his son uh, in that. And we should, uh, if we see spiritual progress, we should be praising the Lord. Now, often when we hear lessons like this, we want to change and we want to become uh, like Christ, but uh, we start thinking about some of the hard situations we're in. Maybe we're in the midst of a family struggle. There's uh, things going on or, or a job change or, or maybe you're battling an illness. And during those times, sometimes we think, boy, it's impossible for me to change. But a lot of times God allows things to come into our lives to shape us. Trust me, 
Abdiel is going to do some things this week and next week and then during his training that he is not going to understand. When I was talking to him, I said, you have to remember they're building you into a team. You have to be able to trust the guy that's next to you. The Marine that's next to you, so they're building you into a team. If he messes up, guess what? You're getting punished along with him. You know why? They're trying to make you a team. They're trying to get you to, to work together as a team, and that's uh, what you need to do. Uh, in that, they're, they're, they're knocking some things away. Well, for here, God wants us to work together as a team with him. He wants us to be conformed uh, to his, his image. Now, trying circumstances typically do one of two things for us. It either drives us away from God or they bring us closer to the Lord. Think about in your life the times where God has allowed trying times to come into your life. It did one of two things. It either brought you closer to the Lord or it pushed you a little bit farther away from him because we get angry with that because we don't like injustice. We want everything to be fair. That was very interesting that, uh, uh, that there is no word for fair. He was talking about the, uh, the other day and uh, in the thing that we learned. And uh, so, but a lot of times we don't, we allow the circumstances to steer us off course and we need not to do that. We need to give those trials to the Lord and allow him to bring us even closer. Let's look at a scriptural illustration. If you would turn to Jeremiah chapter 18. In Jeremiah chapter 18, we have the Lord speaking to uh, the prophet. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse number one says this. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, uh, excuse me, and the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. It says, And I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the will. And the vessel that he, uh, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, yet another vessel, and it seemeth good to the potter to make it. How many of you have been to Connor Prairie? Sean doesn't count. He's there every day. All right. If you go to Connor Prairie, and I, I, I love going there. I've driven uh, several times for. Um, for the school, and uh, you go and you, you look at where they're making pottery, making dishes and things, and you watch that person spinning that wheel. They could take that, that old lump of clay and turn it into a very beautiful uh, pot. Uh, somebody had to make these things up here, uh, uh, spinning on a wheel. Is there one down there? Oh, it's glass. And, uh, but somebody had to do that. A lot of times we are like that piece of clay. Look at what verse 5 says. And the words of the Lord came to me saying, The house of Israel, I cannot, uh, uh, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? And he sa uh, saith the Lord, Behold, as the clay in the potter's hand, so are my hand, O, uh, so are ye in my hand, O Israel. We just have to think of ourselves as being just an old chunk of clay. And we're on the, the will of circumstances that God allows into our life. Now, just as the potter plans, as he prepares the clay, God is our potter and he knows what process that we need to go through so that he can transform us. He shapes us into different uh, things. He, he makes us in, in different ways. He doesn't uh, make all of us the way. He knows uh, how to allow the pressure uh, to be, uh, how not to allow the pressure to be too great or the spiritual fire to become unbearable. We are safe in his gentle hands. Now, how many of you took uh, ceramics when you were in school? I did. My dad still has things in his, in his room that I made. I was not a good potter person. And uh, it wasn't perfect like you, you see. But you know what? I made it for my dad, so it was precious to him. And uh, he still has it. And a lot of times, uh, when... when things that we would put in our hands if we, if we tried to shape our lives it would be all a muck and a mess but in the hands of our savior he just works different things in our life and shapes us in different ways allows us to come through different circumstances all to get us to be conformed to the image of his son 
As we go through trials, we can rest assured that we are in the potter's hands and that (coughs) he has a purpose for everything he allows us to go through. You think of some of the trials that God has allowed you to go through. You didn't understand them when you were going through them. But now you can look back and see how God was shaping you. How God was guiding you. And how God was doing some things for you in your life. And uh, we should be thankful for that. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, a lot of people like to, to quote this, but I think it goes right with this story of the potter. It says, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and them who are called according to his purpose. God is only going to allow things to come into our life as he is shaping us that he can help us get through. So transformation is a process. It takes time. It takes time. He's still working on me. Uh, I said that last week, and then when I spoke in chapel on Friday, they sang it in here. He's still working on me, the whole song. And I thought, thought about this, this lesson, but it takes time. Then transformation is personal, and that we must present our bodies as a living sacrifice to the Lord. And then lastly, transformation, though, is also practical, and that it involves a specific steps, uh, specific steps for us uh, to take to encourage the process of sanctification. So let's kind of look at that word sanctification, do a little bit of word study uh, with that. The word sanctification is defined as this, as a state of growing in divine grace as a result of Christian commitment. That's how Webster defines it. The word sanctification is found five times in the New Testament and they are all defined this way. Purification, purification, or purity, or uh, holiness. Now, to better understand what you need to know is to look at the base of the word, and that is sanctify. To sanctify means this, to set apart for, uh, for, sacred, for sacred purpose or religious use, or uh, to be free from sin. The easiest way that, that I can remember this is set apart for sacred use. Now, I have this bottle of water. It says it's purified water. Now, when I went to go, well, when I went to go open it, I wanted to make sure that I heard the little, the little knob at the top click, 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 means that it was still sealed. If it wasn't sealed, my plant would have been drinking this water, not me. And uh, if you leave bottles of water around the church and I find them, I just take them into my plants and give them to my plant. And uh, but this one, what was for me? It's purified water. It was set apart uh, for use for me, so that therefore I, uh, I have it now. The practical step of spiritual transformation is for us to be renewed, though, in the spirit of our mind. Go back to our, our, uh, our text here in Romans. We've presented our bodies as a reasonable sacrifice. God calls that our reasonable service. But then it says, uh, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed okay, by the renewing of your mind. Now, the renewing of our mind uh, should be one of the most divine and delightful and daily occurrences in our life. It is not, um, it is not uh, uh, hard, it is, comp- uh, it, is, it is real, and here's the process. How do, how do we transform our minds? Well, first of all, we need to get out the old. The Bible tells us in, in Ephesians chapter four, verses 22 through 24 this, uh, that ye put off concerning the former conversation. That word conversation means lifestyle. The old man. You need to put off the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So we have to put things off and put things on. So what are things that we should put off? Well, we should put off old habits. Old habits that are, are not uh, glorifying to God. Say, what are they? You know what they are. You know what habits that you have that uh, are not pleasing to God. I mean, if, if you've got a kid sitting at the dinner table and they're not eating their dinner, but they're digging for gold, you tell them, stop that, that's disgusting, right? It's a disgusting habit. Right? Okay, I'm just trying to make it practical. Okay? Well, there are disgusting habits that we have spiritually that God tells us, stop that. 
Don't do that. Don't say that. Don't think that. We need to put those habits off. Second way is we need to put off destructive relationships. You know what? Just because somebody calls themselves a Christian does not mean that they are good for you. There are some people that are very destructive in our Christian life. They attend the same church. They do the same things. But they have a destructive tongue. Or maybe they have destructive habits. You could just fill in the blank. But sometimes we just have to say, you know what? I can't hang out with you. You're not good for my spiritual walk. You need to put off old thought patterns. Sometimes we just have stinking thinking. And we need to think a different way. We need to put off old offenses and learn to forgive. Some of the most miserable people in this world are people that have never learned to forgive. They're happy being offended. If they're miserable and they're making other people miserable, they're happy. Doesn't make any sense to me. We need to learn to forgive. Now, whoever said that you could forgive and forget, it's, it's pretty hard. But we can learn to forgive. Sometimes people try to transform without getting rid of sin. Now, before you can move forward in your Christian life, you need to get rid of sin, which clouds our minds and hinders God's process of sanctification, of purifying us. Would it do me any good to take a shower in a mud pit? No, right? I may get the top half of my body clean, but the bottom half is... I need to get to a place to where I can get clean. I can't stay in the muck and mire of sin and expect God to sanctify me. I have to climb out of that. I have to be willing to take some steps to get rid of some things. We need to make sure that we don't cloud our, get our mind cloud. God does not want to share his preeminence in your mind with unconfessed sin. The psalmist said this, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not what? Hear me. He will not hear me. I could pray all day long, but if I've got sin in my life, God's not obligated to listen to me. God's not obligated to do anything for me. Remember my dad was telling me one time he was witnessing to a man that he drinks coffee with. And the guy said, listen, when I get to heaven, I'll be doing all the talking to God. <laughs> my dad said, yeah, you keep thinking that. He said, you'll be on your face before God. A lot of times we treat God that way on this side of glory. Like he owes us something. He better be listening up. It doesn't work that way. We need to get rid of the iniquity. It says, if I regard iniquity in my heart. That's where it's at. Second thing is this. We not only need to get, get out the old, but we need, to put on, we need to put the new end. Once we get rid of the old thoughts that are dishonoring to the Lord, we need to allow God to transform our minds by replacing those thoughts with new ones that please him. And I've been doing yard work and stuff and, and uh, I come in and I've sweat through my clothes during the summer. Does it do me any good to take them off, get in the shower, then get back out and put those same clothes right back on? You'd say, you're foolish. A lot of times that's what we do spiritually. I've got to get rid of those, put them in their dirty clothes and put something new on, something fresh on uh, in that. And so we need to do that. So, uh, the Bible tells us in, in, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, and this would be an excellent verse to memorize this. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, what's the next four words? 
Think on these things. That's where our thinking needs to be. When those impure thoughts try to pass through our mind, when that gossip tries to come through our ears, we need to put a stop to it. That's not, that, that doesn't come with the virtue and, and the praise and all of those things. So what are, what are some ways that we can get good, put good thoughts in our mind? Well, I think there are several ways. Let me give you five. Number one, what do you think the number one thing I'm going to say is? Read your Bible. Read your Bible. And just don't read it for the sake of reading it. Read it to study it. James tells us to, I mean, uh, Paul tells us what? Study to show thyself approved. Learn to do word studies. If you don't understand what a word means, look it up. Study it. Chase it down. I spent a lot of time doing that today. Just, just some, some different words. I thought, I didn't know that's what that meant. I didn't know it was only in there that much. The Bible tells us that we need to study. And by studying it and reading it, then I come to understand the word of God better. And it helps my thinking. Second thing we need to do is to pick a verse or a passage and memorize it. We need to start with verses that deal with the sin that we're struggling with. You want to get rid of sin in your life, find out what the book says about it, what the Bible says about it. Memorize those verses. When Satan put Jesus to the temptation, what did Jesus do? He quoted the word of God back. Why did he do that? To demonstrate to us what we need to do. The Bible tells us in James, submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will what? Right. You want to get him to run faster? Start quoting the book. He knows it's true. Number three, listen to godly music or podcast or books. Listen to good things. Listen to a podcast when I'm driving in every morning, going through the book of James now. I've learned some, not the book of James, the book of Philippians. We just finished the book of James. I've read Philippians several times, but already in just the first eight verses that, that, that they've studied in the last three days, I've been learning some things. So I'm learning some different, some really good things uh, to know. But uh, listening to godly music. Music has a way of, of speaking to us when no other, uh, in a way that no other medium can. Listen to, to, to good books that teach us. Number four, listen to sound biblical preaching. And you can just about find anything on the internet these days. Be careful what you listen to and who you listen to. But find some good stuff to listen to. Some good messages. You don't have to just wait for Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. It's good to listen to the word. And lastly, most importantly, ask the Lord to help guide you in who and what to listen to when you're praying to him. Ask him to guide you. So we need to put off, we need to put on. Then lastly, we need to guard what goes in. We're told in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 this, keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life that word keep means to guard now once you have gotten the old out and you replaced it with the new the battle isn't over it's not over Satan knows exactly how to get in he knows exactly what buttons to push he knows exactly where our weakness is he's always looking to exploit that weakness you watch uh, football games. You always see the battles between the offensive and the defense and the coordinators trying to figure out what play the other person's going to run and how they can stop that. You know what? We need to be on the offensive. We need to be on the defensive. That's why we're instructed in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 8, uh, 10 through 18, to put on the whole armor of God. Why? That we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You know, how many of you have a home security system? Why do you have that? To guard your valuables, to guard your home. 
You don't want somebody to come and take your stuff. So you, you secure it. You keep it. You guard it. To protect it. We need to do the same thing. We need to have that, that, that godly security system in our life to keep us from falling. We must set up the defensive perimeter to be on guard for every possible way Satan will try to enter our lives. That's why Jesus told us that we need to take up our cross daily and follow him. Only you know what specific doors of your mind that Satan will try to use to gain entrance, to tempt you, or to derail your godly thinking. Shore up those doors. Make sure that the lock works there. Perhaps you struggle with doubt or anxiety. Your fleshly thinking may lean towards covetousness or jealousy. So others may struggle with impure thoughts or wicked temptations. Set up a guard to protect your heart and to defend against the devil's attack on your spiritual maturity. God will bless your efforts and you will find great joy in Christ as you continue on your journey of sanctification. None of us have arrived yet. We need to constantly be on guard. You know what? Criminals don't discriminate. They don't go, well, you know, there's an elderly couple living there. I don't, I don't think I'll rob that house. Let me find somebody who's younger. No, they, they try to exploit weakness in any way they can. They're always trying to find a way in. Satan's always trying to find a way into our lives. We need to make sure that we don't allow him. The Bible tells us in, that, in verse, uh, chapter 12, verse number 2, and be not conformed. It is interesting to note that the word conformed found in our text in Romans 12 is a neutral word. It can have a good or bad connotation. It's other two, uh, the other two times that it's found in Scripture, uh, it's found two other times in Scripture, and both times they are commands to be conformed to the image of Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 29, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. This word conform gives us the idea of being fashioned uh, to or shaped into something. We are warned not to be conformed to this world. That word world there means age. That place and time. What the world wants to shape us into its image right now. They want us to accept all kinds of, of things. Sins that, that uh, many of you in here uh, never even heard of. You blush to talk about when you were kids are now open and people just do them and they just expect you to just, you know, accept whatever lifestyle somebody wants to live. No, there is right and there's wrong. And we're not to be conformed to this age, to this time. This verse uh, is telling us not to be shaped uh, by the age which you live in. Now, this world defines success in, with money and accomplishments. If you allow the world to take a pocket knife and whittle on you, it will try to shape you into uh, its image. Don't let that evil, the evil age, conf conform you to its image. Now, we must, uh, if your mind is renewed, you will realize that God is more important than anything uh, that this world has to offer. Now, <clears throat> the word success is found one time in the Bible. And that one time tells us the way that we can have success is found in obeying the word of God. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8 says this, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. If you want to be a successfully transformed Christian, you have to follow the book. You have to follow the instructions. I remember when I was young, got married, and we, we moved into our house out there in Fortville. I was putting together a shed. You know what I did with the instruction book? I threw it to the side. I said, I don't need this thing. I could put this thing together. I know what I'm doing. I got halfway through and guess what I had to do? I had to take it apart because things weren't matching up. 
because I didn't follow the instructions. I was a man, I didn't have to. I had tools. A lot of times we think that we don't need the instructions, that we can get by without it. Then we find ourselves in all kinds of mess. And trust me, it's a lot harder to take something apart and put it back together than if you'd have just done it right the first time. God wants us to be transformed into his son's image. It takes time because it's a process. It's personal. Only we can allow God to work in us. But it's practical. It's not hard. Joy can be found in the Christian life through the transforming power of Christ. Through his strength, we can be transformed by renewing our minds. Your challenge for this week is this, is to see how God is trying to shape you and transform you. And to become a better Christian this week than you were last week. And just to continue to grow. Let's stand together, please. I have a lot of, a lot of homebodies in here tonight. And, uh, and many of us know where we're at in our Christian walk. I, I understand that. But perhaps maybe God is speaking to your heart and, and just telling you, hey, these are some things that you need to do to help you. Why not just allow him to do that work in your life?